<clears throat> what is the relationship between logic and nature? At what points do they quilt together? Can we formalize these points? So I will answer these questions through eight arguments contending that logic and nature are quilted together at a Ponte Capitan um, or a suture. The Ponte Capitan or quilting point was employed by Lacan to denote the point at which signifier joined together is signified. Here I take the liberty of asking how logic is quilted into nature. The quilting point is very much like a suture to put it in a Badusian parlance, where two ontological layers, let's call them, are joined together at a void that is likewise a pure point. I deploy this metaphor here as I argue that logic and nature are two distinct registers that are nonetheless entwined. The spatiality of this incursion is critical to the argument. I will begin by exploring the gap between Hegel's science of logic and philosophy of nature and develop a spatial theory of the interiority of logic as an exteriority of nature. I argue that we can see this relationship spatially as between the many ones of logic and the void of nature. Simply, it is a relationship of the one and the void, but more particularly, the ones and the void. I argue that logic is simply the application of points to space, so that if we are to know nature, it is by this application of difference to indifference, the sublation of pure space with points. Thus, I examine the work of quantum physics and contend that we as philosophers need to examine modern physics, and yes, we need to take seriously the work of Slavoj Žižek, who has been highlighting this link between logic and nature for the last three decades. What is important is that the relationship between physics and philosophy is not some seemingly random coincidence. We are not pointing to quantum physics to say, hey, look, here, Hegel was right. The scientists have proved it. Um, instead, what we are doing is attempting to rejoin two fields which are typically disentangled in a way that joins together epistemology and ontology. The unique way in which quantum physics takes the observer into account vis-a-vis -vis experimentation makes the intervention of quantum physics a prime topos upon which we can quilt philosophy. I conclude by examining the incompletion of logic in nature as well as the function of the quantum leap. One, Hegel's gap from logic to nature. The notorious closing lines of Hegel's science of logic have been analyzed at length by a variety of authors, but here I pay particular intention, attention to the spatiality Hegel details. In this culmination of the logic, Hegel writes that the idea freely discharges itself, producing the externality of space and time absolutely existing for itself without subjectivity. This externality of space and time is, of course, nature. In philosophy of nature, Hegel repeatedly refers to nature as externality as well as self-externality. Thus, it is nature that is external to the idea. Hegel writes that the idea um, from externality has come to itself. It raises itself up, completes the self-liberation in the science of spirit, and the science of logic finds the highest concept of itself, the pure concept conceptually comprehending itself. What is critical for us here is that the idea liberates itself, it discharges itself, necessarily creating the externality of nature. Moreover, we are told that the idea has come to itself. Let us read this as follows. The idea has stepped outside of itself, into the externality of nature, and returned to itself. It has self-constituted through self-externalization. This is not an unfamiliar theme in Hegel. Hegel's self-consciousness is formed through a self-externalization, battle to the death, and return into itself. Self-externalization and being beside oneself, as he's also Zika Komen, as Hegel writes in Phenomenology of Spirit, is the very process through which we become self-aware. Being beside oneself, both in German and in English, has the implication of anxiety. It's not a comfortable feeling, it is uncanny. Another example of self-externalization is, of course, Lacan's constitution of the subject. The subject must misrecognize herself in the mirror, form her ego ideal, and return to herself. The circle of circles in Hegel and Lacan is genuinely a Mobius strip of movement. We return to the start disoriented. The self is, in this way, non-coincidental with herself. What does this mean for logic? Frank Ruda argues that absolute knowing is that which knows it doesn't know. We can see the same articulation here in the externalization of the idea. The idea must step outside itself into the indeterminacy of nature. Nature is that which is outside of logic. It is the indeterminate space, the externality to an internal system of logic. When the idea does this, it realizes it is cloaked in the indeterminacy of nature. The idea comprehends itself in realizing the contingency of its logical system, that logic is just a series of points floating in space. This is what it realizes in its freedom. It is ensconced in indeterminacy. This is the relationship between logic and nature, and this is critical. Logic is a system of determinations set against an indeterminate nature. Thus, I posit a spatial relationship between logic and nature. Nature is what is external, what is outside. Logic is an internal delimited system that is inscribed against this void. 
Hence, as I will continue to explain, nature acts as an empty space set, set against logic's points. So, two, nature is space. So, um, Hegel's philosophy of nature begins with space, so, where he writes that space is indifferent continuity. Space is pure indeterminacy, it's pure indifference. Space is simply the relations between things. And this Hegel tells us is its contradiction. Space is pure relationality and thus must be sublated by relations because we necessarily cannot think space on its own. My contention is that space is the indifferent ground necessary for the emergence of difference. Just like we cannot think of pure nothing, neither, we can, neither can we think of pure space. So Hegel writes in Science of Logic and Philosophy of Nature respectively. Space cannot exist on its own as it is simply relational. This imminently moves us to consider how space is sublated through the point and through time. We will focus in this paper on the point. Hegel writes that the point is the negation of space. A point is difference as such. If space is in different continuity, the point is the interruption of difference. When we draw out points in nature, we introduce difference into the indifference of space, into the indifference of nature. Hence, and this is essential to the argument, when we apply points to nature, we are applying logic to nature. Thus, we can read Hegel's philosophy of nature as introducing us to nature as space. After the indifference of space is introduced, then we are detailed a theory of the application of logic to nature via points, time, place, etc. Nature itself is this indifferent continuity. It is indeterminate until we use logic to determine it. Hence, in Kozhev's lectures on Hegel, he concludes that, quote, without man, nature would be space and only space, end quote. And as Hegel infamously said when summoning the Alps, es ist so, so it is. <laughs> Frank Ruda has also argued that nature is just indifference. Nature cannot grasp itself. It is external without inner sense. Hegel himself tells us that while we can certainly apply logic to nature, nature's contingencies will guarantee that we can never perfectly formalize nature. Nature is this pure indifference. Nature is space in the sense that it is continuous, it is indifferent, and it is not nature that differentiates itself, but necessarily logic which differentiates. Three, logic is points. Thus, as soon as we apply logic to nature, as soon as we introduce points, we come to differentiate nature and make sense of it. Points, let us recall, are this sublation of indifferent space with difference, as Hegel tells us in philosophy of nature. Um, in Science of Logic, Hegel writes that the point is the totally abstract limit, but in a determinate existence. We can see how the point follows imminently from space. It is an abstract limit, but it is what brings forth determination once we situate it concretely, i.e. in relation with other points. A single point on its own tells us very little. But once we have a series of points, we can start to literally draw connections. Logic is effectively just that, a system of relations amongst points. Insofar as logic is relational and determinate, we can see how logic can be, can be construed spatially as the connection between different inscribed points. In Science of Logic, Hegel discusses the one and the void. This classic atomistic problem presents us with the rendering of being a non-being. Likewise, we have effectively a point in space. But Hegel describes how the one must give rise to the many ones through the one's own contradiction with its self-relation. When the many ones or the many points appear on the scene, we are oriented amongst the many ones by what Hegel calls the one one. This one one is our arbitrary stake in the ground. It's the one that gets stuck. Thus, with the many ones or many points in space, we develop a system of relationality amongst these points. I draw the connection between logic's determinant relationality and points in space. In science of logic, determinant being is defined by Hegel as being in a certain place or the unity of being and non-being. Beings in a certain place, in a certain logical place, are in that place by virtue of their relation with other identities. To determine is to situate a being in its logical place, and this place is necessarily relational. It is logically spatialized. Thus, we can understand determinant beings, i.e. the basic logical function, as spatially relational. We can see determinant beings as points whose orientation and relation to each other is their determination. We choose an arbitrary point in the ground as our point of orientation, or as Hegel calls it, the one one. To take a page from 20th century science, Ernst Mach refuted Newton's absolute conception of space by arguing for space's relativity. While space is relative, he emphasized we need to pick a point of orientation in order to interpret data. He often chose the stars. To draw on our previous analysis, logic creates an internality. When we draw a line between two or more points, we create a network of relations. Networks of relations necessarily denote an in-group and demonstrate an out-group, an externality. In this case, that externality is just the emptiness of space. 
Thus, I reaffirm my argument, the relationship between logic and nature can be productively read as spatialized. Nature is in different space and logic is a system of differences. Nature in this sense is the void against which a series of points are inscribed, whose relations are the internality of logic. Nature is determined insofar as we apply logical points to it and draw connections between these points. Four, threading logic in nature. What quantum physics teaches us and what Zizek has emphasized in his own works is that this application of logic to nature constitutively changes the ontological structure of nature. To draw on our spatial discussion, when we apply logic to nature, we draw out points in nature. On the one hand, these points necessarily change the relation of indifferent space against which the points are inscribed. And likewise, the logical points themselves are expressions of nature insofar as they are inscribed onto nature. When we observe the electron, we force it to determine a spin, either clockwise or counterclockwise. We take a space of indeterminacy in which there's a 50% chance the electron is spinning clockwise, and we transform it into a determinate point. Now it is spinning clockwise, so the probability has shifted from 50% to 100%. We transform an indeterminate space through our observation and force nature to thus determine. Thus, what Zizek rightly points out is that while there is a parallax relationship between logic and nature, the two are necessarily entangled. Hence, we have to reject idealist notions that, you know, to take an extreme example, I close my eyes and the world out there disappears. And we have to reject the extreme materialist example that the world out there exists completely independently of my interiority. Subject and object are entangled. In a truly Hegelian way, both as substance and as subject, there is an entanglement between subject and substance. Even Werner Heisenberg tells us, quote, we cannot disregard the fact that natural science is formed by men. Natural science does not simply describe and explain nature. It is a part of the interplay between nature and ourselves. It describes nature as exposed to our method of questioning, end quote. When we are trying to locate the quilting point between logic and nature, we therefore must draw the conclusion that logic's application to nature transforms nature itself. But my argument is not simply that logic and nature are entangled. My argument is specifically about space. We transform a space of potentiality of indeterminacy and we determine it. We impose points onto an indeterminate space. We place ones into the void. Thus, while some quantum physicists are tempted to call nature evental, here I quote Carlo Rovelli, it is actually, I argue, that we impose events onto nature. We transform nature through our interaction with it. There is indeterminate nature out there, and there is logical interiority, but logic and nature are further constituted when the two entangle, when we experiment on nature, when we interact with it. Five, uncertainty or indeterminacy. Heisenberg tells us that we cannot know both the position and the momentum of the electron. The more we know about one, the less we know about the other. This uncertainty is built into our determinism. To Heisenberg, knowledge of the atom's position and momentum is fundamentally an epistemic problem. We are barred in our knowledge. Heisenberg is a true Kantian in this way. There is a world out there with features. We just can't know them, or more specifically, we can't know them all at once. Niels Bohr, his theory of complementarity highlights this precise problem that we can only know either the atom's position or its momentum. But unlike Heisenberg, Bohr argues that the position of the atom, for example, is fundamentally indeterminate as we determine the atom's momentum. To Bohr, in an even stronger sense, indeterminacy is part of the ontological makeup of nature. We do not know what is there until we determine it. It's not that there is nothing until we determine it. It's that nature exists in a state of indeterminacy until we determine it. This is its ontological character. Hence, Bohr is the true Hegelian. Instead of arguing that there is an epistemic gap between us and nature, Bohr folds this gap into the very ontological structure of nature itself. In terms of space, what quantum physics teaches us is that there is a literal space of indeterminacy, a cloud, right, um, that exists until we determine it. That is, until we plot points out onto nature itself, this is the character of logic. It is discerning, differentiating, determining. This furthers my argument that nature is indeterminate space. Space is in this way, potentiality. This is what nature is until the application of logic. Six, the leap as Aufhebung. Um, the quantum leap that the electron instantaneously moves between levels in the atomic cloud, is, not, is this not an example of Aufhebung in nature? As Hegel writes in the preface to phenomenology, at a certain point, the acorn becomes a tree. At a certain point, the dawn breaks. This is sublation, that a qualitative shift occurs. A new identity is born. It necessarily leaps into this new identity. 
incremental transition fails to describe what occurs. The atom changes position in the cloud, not in an incremental way, it leaps, it jumps. Likewise, at a certain point, Achilles overtakes the tortoise, not in a rational incremental way, as Zeno points out, but in a leap. Thus, the application of logic to nature sees actual sublation, actual apebong occur, defying classical physics. What this highlights for us is that there is a dialectic of continuity and discreteness in nature, that there is smooth continuity, but likewise discontinuous leaps. This is the heart of the Achilles and the tortoise paradox. Hegel writes in Philosophy of Nature that we can't comprehend the sublation of space and time by motion. Much like a standard film is displayed at 24 frames per second, the eye smooths, o smooths over these broken points. This is truly the contradiction of quantizing everything, that there is smoothness that rushes over finite edges. I argue that we can see the logic of the leap, but both in Hegel and in quantum physics, as a further extension of the analysis I have been developing regarding points in the void. Points are discrete, and they are set against a continuous void. To connect these points in a logical fashion requires a smoothing over of their striation. The actual leap between points, I argue, is aufhebung, i.e. the insurmountability between two points in space that is nonetheless surmounted. Thus, logic's mapping onto nature demonstrates the indeterminacy of space, the determinacy of points, and the sublation between these points. The spatial analysis demonstrates the entanglement of logic in nature, that nature is transformed when we apply logic to it. Seven, the incompletion of logic in nature. A necessary conclusion we can draw from the spatial analysis of logic in nature is the incompletion of both. Hegel writes in Philosophy of Nature, no matter how far I reach out my arm, I can always place a star, for the universe is nowhere nailed up with boards. We can keep determining nature. There will always be more for us to determine. Space will always exist alongside our, our determination. If we take a page from Badu, the void will errantly appear. We can always add the void onto any set. But more specifically, there is always more space, more indeterminacy for us to determine. We can make this conclusion because this is what space is. It is relationality that grounds relations. This stands true for both logic and nature. This is the optimism of both, that neither is complete. There is always more space. There's always more non-being. Hence, we take a page from Lacan. Nature is not all. It is patu. Eight, answering the question how logic builds into nature. So what I've argued is that there's a spatial relationship between logic and nature. Logic's interiority is contrasted with nature's exteriority. Logic necessitates an exteriority in order for it to self-constitute. It requires a bare minimum of space. Logic as a system of determinacy, as a system of relations, necessitates the externality of indeterminate nature. Nature is simply indeterminate space. We sublate this indifference with points, that is with logic. Hence, quantum physics beautifully illustrates this by telling us that nature is ontologically changed by observation. Thus, nature is, yeah, there we go. If we take Niels Bohr's approach, the indeterminacy of nature is folded into the very structure of nature. Thus, I conclude that logic and nature are joined by a suture, by a point de capitaine. Logic and nature are joined together by a gap, but which is nonetheless a pure point. The gap is constitutive. Logic and nature exist on two parallax planes, but they are entangled as logic maps itself onto nature via points. What I've hoped to demonstrate is that nature's indeterminacy is transformed by logic's determinacy. Spatially, nature is potentiality. It is open space. We sublate space with difference, i.e. logical points. And so what I'm concluding in a very radical way is that this reading demonstrates the collapse of epistemology onto ontology, the entanglement of logic and nature, the indeterminacy of nature, which is transformed by the determinacy of logic. Thank you.